Thank you. Turn your Bibles to Psalm 63. The title of my message tonight is My Soul's Defense. Beautiful. We've been preaching three sermons here through Psalm 63. We're going to be looking at verses 7 through 11 as we conclude. Let's read that whole psalm again together one last time. Psalm of David in the wilderness as he was fleeing from Absalom. He's a king. He's been removed from the throne by the betrayal of his own son. He finds himself traveling or hiding in the wilderness. And this is the song of his soul, crying out to God, asking God to help him. Psalm 63, the Bible says this, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee, my flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. To see thy power and thy glory as so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life. My lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword, and they shall be a portion for foxes. But the king, but the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by him shall glory, but the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. My soul's defense. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we need a defender. Lord, we need someone that looks after us, that protects us. Lord, you've called us on a path and on a journey. Lord, that makes heaven our home, and this world is not our home. Lord, as we preached about this morning, that makes us outliers or nonconformists to the world system. And Lord, because we are on our own, we have you only, we need you as our defender. And so Lord, I pray tonight that we would rest assured that we would have confidence and peace about the defense that you provide for your own. Lord, we love you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Notice where we left off last week, verse 6, when I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. We had left the last, our last sermon about our soul's desire, talking about how David went to bed at night with a clear conscience before God, that he was able to not have the anxieties of the world, but rather have his thoughts on, on the things of God and, and who God is and what God has, was able to do in his life and what God had promised him. And, and so David was not an anxious man, but he was a man that was worshiping God and had the peace of God. And notice how verse 7 says, Because thou hast been. See, it was in the meditating on the night watches that God was able to remind David of his faithful character, of his long suffering. It was in the stillness of the night watch. It was in the quietness of his bed. It was in in those moments that David was able to hear the still, small voice of God in the quietness of sleep. Sometimes, unfortunately, the only time that we're ever quiet is when we go to bed. You got to be quiet for a little while. Just hear God. And it's in that moment of quietness that David is reminded by God's spirit of what God has done. And look what the Bible says there in verse 7. Because thou hast been my help. David needed help. Do you ever need help? Do you ever need help? I, I think I need help every week. Every day, I, I, if I were to take a, if there's a, the heavenly log, the heavenly journal of prayers 
to God. And I'm not talking about simply the prayers that come out of the form of a list and you're sitting in your prayer closet and you're, that formal time that you're spending to God, but, but just the cry of your heart throughout your day, God, I need your help. God, I need your help to get this done right now. God, I need your help to let this go through. God, I, God, I need your help to, you know, whatever it is in those moments, I, I hope that that is the heartbeat of your life. A continual asking God for help. God, I need help. Because what does help acknowledge? In the, in the cry for help is the humility of insufficiency. A young person, in, in the pride of your youth, learn the humility of what it is to ask for help. Many young man thinks he has something to prove, so he doesn't ask for help. Because in help, there's a humility. I, I need help. I can't do this. It's bigger than me. It's more than me. And David had come to a point in his life where as the king, he realized, I need help. I need God's help. And beloved, I hope you live every day of your life, not with pride, but with humility, saying, God, I will take all the help you can give me. I, there won't be any resistance to it, God. Whatever humility I have to have in my life in order to gain your help, that is my cry. And David cried for help. And he remembered this in the night watches, the faithful character of God. And God's character is that of help her. Think about that. It's his character. It's who he is. God is a helper. That's what he does good at. He's really good at it. He's actually the best helper. He's a helper. That's, that's just who he is. God does not have the purpose to help. He is helpful by nature. His existence is helpful. Uh, praying to him is helpful. Having a, a part of our lives is helpful. And David finds himself here in the wilderness. His flesh in danger, his soul vexed remembering that he needs help from God, needing a defender. So we've seen our desire and our delight, and now we'll see our, my soul's defense. And tonight we have for you in conclusion three thoughts concerning your soul's defense in God. Your soul's defense in God. You know, there's some help that goes all the way down to the soul of the man. You need soulful help. You need help in your soul. I mean, I mean, it's all right to ask God for help in the little things, in the temporary things, in the physical things. God, help me get this project done. Help me, help me get through this light, <laughs> red light. Help me not get in an accident. But then there's some things that go all the way to the very core of who you are, your very soul. God, I need help in my soul. This issue, this weight, this problem is bearing down all, it drills through the veneer that I'm able to put on. It drills through my ability to work. It drills through that, and it touches the nerve of my soul. And in that place, David had a defense. And God had a defense for David's soul. Number one, David's soul's defense was found in the vicinity of God. In the vicinity of God. Look at verse 7. Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee. Thy right hand upholdeth me. God's help is found in the vicinity of God. That is where it's felt the strongest. That is where it's the most real. And beloved, if you need God's help, get with God. Get with God. You know, it's the lie of the devil that might tell an individual, well, you haven't been running with God. You haven't been walking with God. You haven't been doing anything with God. And now all of a sudden that you need help, you're going to go back to God. Well, hey, you know what? Don't listen to the devil's lie. Get back with God. Get back in the vicinity of God because the devil knows that when you are underneath, as the Bible says here, the shadow of his wings, he can't harm you because God's got you. You see, God's, David's soul's defense was found in the vicinity of God, in the proximity of God, in nearness to God. Beloved, get near God. Notice here the security in the shadow of his wings. 
David says there in verse 7, he says, Therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. If I can just get within the wings of God, if I can just get into the bosom of God, if I can just get into the embrace of God, I can rejoice because I know there nothing can touch me. That God has me. The Bible says here that in, in God's def- for God's defense to get in the shadow of his wings. If you want God's help, you need to be willing to get around God. See, God's invitation is open. And God's willingness and desire to help is rich. All it requires of you is your willingness to get in proximity to God. Remove the things that separate you from him. Remember the prodigal son described to us in the Gospel of Luke? And he asked his father for all of his inheritance, and he went and he spent it all on riotous living, and he found himself one day in the pig pen eating the husk that the pigs were eating, in the mire and in the muck. And he thought to himself, he says, the servants in my father's house have have it better than I have right now. And he came up with an idea, if I can just get back home and get within vicinity of my father, I will beg just to be a servant and I will have it better than I have it now. The the father was faithful, waiting for the son to return, willing to offer his defense so as long as the child came back to him. And beloved, that's where you might be tonight. And you say, I need God's help, but I'm in the muck, and I'm in the pen, and I'm in, I'm, I'm in the, the filth of the world. And the Bible says here, listen, that your sin separates you from God, but there is a remedy for that, and that's the blood of Jesus. Sin separates from God. Think about this in the providence of God, that sometimes your need for help is God's way of getting you to see your need to get right with him. I need help. I need to get right with God. And so your urgency, your help, is the alarm. It's the toothache that tells you something is wrong. Get it fixed. Your sin separates you from God, but yet... David said that if I can get within the wings of my father, I will rejoice. My house, sometimes the girls get in a little bit of trouble, and I say, come here. Come over to me. I'm not chasing you around your house. No, get over here. I'm not running after you. And so they come, and their initial posture is to be at least two arm lengths away from me. You know what I mean? No, 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 no. We're not having this discussion until you're close enough for me to grab you. <laughs> and so they'll itch forward, and they'll itch forward, and they'll, and they'll finally get there. And then I get a hold of them, and I don't get this close. Get this close. And let's deal with this. But, beloved, let me say this. Not only is, there a, is that a corrective measure, and maybe some of you tonight need God's help, but, but, but you understand that there's just some things you're going to have to get right with God. And you're going, to have to, you're going to have to weigh out how long you can hold out for his help and when you're going to just submit to him and give him what he wants. He just wants you. He just wants you. And so you pull him close, but listen, not only is that there, a, there is a, a, a necessity for them to be right with me, to be that close to me, but i got to tell you this, there's no safer place for them to be than right close to me, where I can grab them. So you ever take your kids to a big crowd or in a dangerous situation, and you grab a hold of them, and you mean, I mean you got their hand, you got their arm, and you're like, if I got a hold of you, you're going to be okay. I'm not going to let go of you. Going through some water or something like that. And so David's defense was found in the vicinity of God. And beloved, your help will be found in the shadow of his wings, in the vicinity of God. And notice Because David realized this. Look what verse 8 says. My soul followeth hard after thee. If that is where help is, does it sound like David's walking? 
Does it sound like David is saying, next week I'll get right with God? Next week I'll get next to God? No, David, the Bible says, my soul followeth hard after thee. That word that is denoted in the Hebrew there, of following hard after thee, had a special relevance to David. It's used in another very familiar story to David and his family. And it was concerning his great-grandmother, Ruth. You remember Naomi with her husband and her sons leave Israel and they go to the land of Moab. And after the death of her husband and the death of her son-in-law, she determines to return back to God. Get back in vicinity of God. Get back to the promised land, to the land of her people and the land of her God. And as she determines to go back, she gives her daughter, she tells her daughters-in-law what her decision is. Her one daughter-in-law, Orpha, decides that I'm going to stay. But Naomi, excuse me, Ruth, determines to go with her mother-in-law, Naomi. She determines to leave Moab and to go with Naomi. And the Bible uses this word again, and it says here in Ruth chapter 1 and verse 14, and they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. Kissed her goodbye. But Ruth clave unto her. Her soul followed hard after her. Ruth clave unto her. In other words, Followed hard after her. Beloved, God's defense for your soul is found in the vicinity of God. When your soul needs God's defense, then follow hard after him. Cleave to him. Hold on to him. Grab a hold of him. Get around where you know he is. And you say, well, listen, I, I'm not a theologian. I'm not, I, I'm not even a church person. I'm not, I, I'm not experienced. I didn't grow up in church. I don't know the stand sit. The, the, what are you supposed to do? Well, let me tell you, first of all, get around the people that seem to know God. And find out how you can have a relationship with God. And beloved, you can get into proximity with God by having a relationship with his son. I so said, how do I have a relationship with his son? Jesus. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And beloved, there is no proximity to God without having a relationship with Jesus. You can't get close to God. You are separated. Your sin separates you from God. But when a person trusts Christ as their Savior, confessing to God what God already knows about them and places their trust and salvation in Jesus alone, that person is given entrance, proximity, vicinity, and is able to get close to God. And for the person that knows Jesus as Savior, their soul's defense is to follow hard after God. Maybe you find yourself in difficult circumstances this evening. My advice to you is follow hard after God. Follow hard after God. Maybe there's a struggle you need help with. Follow hard after God. Don't waste any time. Have a little urgency. Get up and down the court with a little, with a little the emphasis in your step, a little sprint in your gait, in your stride. Have some urgency about yourself and follow hard after God. Not only was David's defense, soul's defense found in the vicinity of God, but secondly, David's soul's defense was found in the victory of God. Look what the Bible says in verses 9 and 10. But those that seek my soul to destroy it, shall go into the lower parts of the earth, and they shall fall by the sword, they shall be a portion, a portion for foxes. Look at these things real quick, quick, three things real quick. 
David sees his foes doomed. Doomed. But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of the earth. See, now he realizes God's his helper. And God's his defender. And that he will have victory in God. And so David sees his foes as doomed by God. The commentator John Phillips says it this way, it is a dangerous thing to oppose the Lord's anointed. So David begins to have a realization and remembrance of who he is and what God had done in his life. David sees his foes as doomed by God. David sees his foes defeated by God. They shall fall by the sword, the Bible says in verse 10, the very first part. They are a defeated foe. They are a deemed foe. In the last part of verse 10, they shall be a portion for foxes. David sees his foes devoured by God. Doomed, defeated, and devoured. And beloved, your true spiritual enemies that have cause against you, know this, that your adversary is a doomed, defeated, and soon-to-be-devoured foe. There is victory in Jesus. There is victory in Jesus. And so you are on the winning side if you are in vicinity with God. Now listen, if you're being a free agent and you're going and doing your own thing and, and there's things, calamities coming your way, well, get underneath the wings of God. Follow hard after God. But when you are in the vicinity of God, understand this, God never loses. Isn't that great? He never loses. He can't lose. It's not even close. If it ever appears close, it's because God is towing, toying with his foes. Man, it looks like maybe the devil's getting the upper hand in this. No, I'm just, to, no, no, don't worry about it. He's not. Now listen, this isn't a brag or a pride that we can apply to our lives. And do not think without introspection and illumination from God's word and the filling of God's spirit and a clear conscience before him that God has endorsed all your foolishness. Don't be claiming God's victories in things that you're not sure that God wants you to be victorious over. And don't be identifying enemies that the Bible hasn't first identified as enemies in your life. Just because they're coming against you does not mean that they might be an enemy. You might be the enemy. And they might be the righteous one. And so you got to think about that. But if you find yourself in the proximity of God, then understand that the victory is God's and that your adversary is doomed, defeated, and devoured. Listen to this statement. And this is where the soul searching has to come. Right, as in being right. Right needs no defense because he will defend what is right. If you're right with God and you're right in the situation and you've done right, and even though you may be, you may be paying the price earthly for doing right, understand this, that right needs no defense. He will defend what is right. It's a way of saying some advice Doc Osteen gave me one time. He says, listen, if you're right, then don't defend yourself. And if you're not right, get right. He said, well, listen, I don't have God's defense in my life right now because I'm not right. Well, there's your answer. Follow hard after God. Get right. But man, I'm, I, Pastor Jay, I got, this is what I'm supposed to do. It's very clear and I'm doing it. Then all right, then don't defend yourself. Let him defend you. You don't have to explain yourself. You don't have to defend yourself. You don't have to make sure everyone else around you knows your side of the situation and your circumstances and how bad you got it. No. God will defend me. God will vindicate this. God will, will make this all right. God will defend what is right. And that brings us to our last point. David's soul's defense was found in the vindication of God. In the vindication of God. 
Now, who does vengeance belong to? God. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. God is the great justifier. God is the great equalizer. God will be the one who will make sure all the accounts are settled and balanced. God will make sure that in eternity and for eternity that it is made right. But David's soul's defense was found in the vindication that is found in God. Look at verse 11. But the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by him shall glory, but the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. I love how verse 11 begins. I love how verse 11 begins. Because you remember, where is David writing this? In the wilderness. Not from the palace, not in the throne room, not with a scepter in his hand. He is writing this in the wilderness, away from all the accoutrements and the benefits and the pleasures of the throne. But David, by the end of the time he gets to the end of the psalm, he has come back to the place of realizing who he is. But the king, David's talking about himself. But the king, because remember, King David, he's the king. But the king shall rejoice in God. Listen to this statement. David was king not because he earned it, usurped it, or inherited it. That's not why David was king. He didn't earn it, he didn't fight for it, and he didn't come from royalty in the family. He wasn't next in line to be king. He was king because God said it. That is why he was king. And so his identity, notice this, now what he's saying here, in the hardest of circumstances, David reclaims his identity that God gave him. The identity that God said, this is who you are. You are the king of Israel. Catch this. His identity was wrapped not in his circumstances, but in his calling. So while not in the palace... He was king. Even though he was sitting on a throne, he was the king. Why? Because God said it. And that God would vindicate his word. What does this mean? How can this mean? What does this mean practically for you and I? If you are being what God has called you to be, then rest assured he will vindicate his own. Preach to the teens in chapel this week, not about doing right, but about being right. And when you're, when you're being right, you will do right. And beloved, if you would be what God has told you you are, be what you are, be what God has said you are, be that that God will vindicate the calling that he has given you in your life. You say, well, well, what has God called me to be? Well, he's first of all invited you to be his child, to be joint heirs with Jesus. Be that. If you're saved, be his child. If you're a male, be a man. If you're a woman, be a woman. That's his calling in your life. If you're married, be a husband. If you're married, be a wife. If you have children, be a mom and dad. If you have a parents, what you do, be a good child. Do you see what I'm saying? It, it, listen, in, in all our problems and in all the things going on in our lives, if we would simply spend 90% of our energy focused on the things that we are supposed to be, you wouldn't have time to get into all the trouble that we seem to find ourselves in. Just do what you're supposed to do. 
be what you're supposed to be. And if you are doing that, you say, you know what? I have found myself in this need of defense from God because I was being a man, I was being a husband, I was being a father, I was being responsible. Then know this, that God will vindicate your calling. See, David was being king. Why? Because God told him he was king. And God vindicated his calling. And so, beloved, busy yourself being what God has called you to be, and God will vindicate that. Let me give you an example here. John the Baptist did what he was. John, did you come out to see a reed shaken in the wind? The Bible says he was a prophet. He was a man of God, fiery man of God. He called out the religious evil of the day, the political interests of the day. John spent his life being what God had called him to be. And that determined what he was supposed to do every day. John, what are you doing today? Well, I'm a prophet, so I guess I'm going to go out in the wilderness, I'm going to preach really hard. Well, why are you going to do that? Because that's what I am. So he did it. And guess where that ended, up, ended him up? <laughs> in jail and beheaded. The earthly result was jail and beheading. But the eternal result was Jesus saying that there was not another one born a woman greater than John. See, he will vindicate his own. See, Herod thought, oh, we, we killed John. We got rid of John. And when you read through the Gospels, it's fascinating. He killed John, and Herod is, everyone has this guilty conscience about killing John because they knew he was from God. And every time after that, there's always this question about the identity of Jesus, and they all feel like, it's John come back to haunt us. I mean, Jesus is just John coming back to haunt us because they knew they were wrong in killing him. And Jesus vindicates John for all of eternity. I tell you this right now, that John is walking the streets of gold in heaven right now, and he is happy, he is glad that he got to suffer for Jesus, and he would not trade the short time in a prison cell and the, and the chopping off of his head for the vindication that God gave to him. There's none greater this side of eternity than John the Baptist. God will defend you being what he called you to be. Make no apology. Man, don't apologize for being a man. Lady, don't apologize for being a woman. Child, don't apologize for being a child. Don't apologize for your calling. Be what God wants you to be, and he will vindicate you. So be so you will know what to do, and do knowing that God will defend you. And so if you find yourself in the need of, your soul needs defense tonight, I wonder if your heart's prayer was like, God, as I'm going through this, and as I'm going through this trial in my life, it's not about what I do, it's, what about what I, it's about what I am. And Lord, help me be what I'm supposed to be. Help me do what, I'm, what you've called me to do, and in that spot, in that vicinity to you and your calling, I will have the utmost confidence in your defense. Heavenly Father, help us. Lord, thank you for being our soul's defender. Lord, encourage and equip us this evening. With every head bowed and eyes closed, maybe there's some here tonight and say, you know, Pastor Jay, there's a situation in my life that that message hits home with. Maybe major, maybe minor. But I need God's help, and what I need to do is get in the vicinity of God and just fulfill my calling and let God do his vindictive, or let God be, uh, do his work in my life. If that's you this morning, would you just signify that with an upraised hand? So Pastor Jay, there's an, er there's an area in my life that I, I need God's help in. Amen, I see your hand. I need God's help, and I need him to be my defender. Amen. And to, for a defense, I just need to get with God. Would you pray for me? Anyone else? Amen. All over the auditorium. Heavenly Father, be with those here that are responding to what they've heard. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and turn to hymn number.